All right, you should be able to share. Oh, okay. So I have done an example. So this is what I did. Okay. So yes. um, this is a fictional uh, um, Probably area not. of performance. I mean, I've, I've, I've been the janitor before uh, in the Navy, <laughs> in the U.S. Navy. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. But yeah. But a good example. Okay, so under the key output measures, I put clean classrooms and, and uh, the, the measures is no dust on chairs and tables, clean floor, no writings on whiteboard. Is that specific enough, you think? Yeah, so the output is, a yes, a clean classroom or cleaned classrooms, but yeah, that's just a minor thing here. So it's the, uh, the goal here is to focus on, you know, after the flurry of activity and tasks and everything else, what do you have when you're done? If you, uh, it was described to me one time as, you know, what's left on the person's desk after they go home at the end of the day. So, but yeah, so you're really focused on what's that output and then what are the measures? How can you tell a good one from a bad one? And so that's, you know, a clean classroom has got no dust, clean floor, et cetera. And you could go on and on depending on who you're working with and what they tell you. Because if you're working with master performers, they know what they are. Now, the, one of the difficulties is, is that most knowledge is non-conscious. And so they're going to be able to tell you the numbers vary a little bit between whether it's a decision that they're making or just thinking about their own tasks, but they're going to give you less than 100%, somewhere between 30% uh, uh, and 50 or 60%, they're going to be able to tell you about what's key, what the measures are. And that's why I prefer working with a team of people at one time so that they can you know, feed off each other's comments and they'll go, oh yeah, that's right. And also, and they'll, mm. it usually stimulates their thinking about things beyond what's really conscious to them. Um, but yeah, so my, my philosophy on this is that, um, and this ties into one of your other questions, my philosophy is whatever comes out from a group or an individual is probably some of the more important things. It doesn't, so they're probably accurate but my list is probably not quite complete. And so then it's another, my third dimension when I look at those kinds of things is, is it appropriate? Well, generally, yes. How is are things measured? How's the output measured? Yeah, these would be appropriate um, if they used uh, foul language in describing it um, as we did in the Navy. Um, then you it'd be inappropriate to write it down that way. But, um, <laughs> But so, so the whole goal here is begin with the end in mind. What's that output? How do you know a good one from a bad one? And then you can begin to list the tasks. So please go ahead with your uh, any other questions or whatever you have. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll send this to you if that's okay with you. Sure. And uh, yeah, so, so these are all. So another thing about the tasks, if you're gonna if you're gonna move on from this, is that. Um, if you were doing this online and uh, somebody said, oh, wait a minute, between two and three, there's another task. Well, you can easily insert it and it'll renumber itself. But when I'm doing this in front of a group on, a, say, a flip chart easel, I bullet the tasks because I, I'm invariably going to, somebody's going to amend my list. They're going to add to it. They're going to want to edit it. And if they add something, I don't want to have a, you know, 2.1, 2.2, and then three. Um, so I learned a long time ago not to number those things. And that I would, see. I, I would actually tell the group why I'm not numbering them now. Later on, way later on, I'll number them. But now I'm hoping that they will look at the list and figure out something's missing and give it to me. So I'm encouraging them to look at this as a living document, a living set of data, and just because we wrote it down and ready to go on to the next page doesn't mean it's necessarily complete. It's probably accurate, but it's incomplete. And so when I talk to people about that, I want them to think that, okay, it's accurate, but incomplete. So that, that, in, that usually encourages people to think about what's missing. Because if I'm dealing with master performers, as I like to do, 
their egos require that they are get it right. They're, they're usually somewhat perfectionists and they want to get it right. And if I suggest that we're not probably complete, then that just makes them crazy and they'll think harder about what's missing. So I'm, I'm manipulating them by design. I tell them I'm manipulating you by design. I'm going to kind of poke at you and say, it's probably accurate, but probably incomplete. Someday we'll get it complete, but I guess we won't do that. And they'll go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me look at that. And they'll look at it harder. And if I have a group of people, they will look at it more intently with the goal of figuring out what's missing. And I've been rewarded by this. <laughs> and then I'll tell the group, because they'll give me more things. And I'll, and I'll say, see, I've been rewarded for manipulating you. And it becomes a joke with a, within a team uh, environment. Um, but that, that's really the goal is to really understand, you know, what are these tasks? Because I got to train people to do the tasks with the end in mind of what's the output and how do we know a good one from a bad one? So we can look at the tasks and say, okay, here's where we, you know, here's where we're dusting chairs and tables. So therefore we know that's really a key and critical task. Um, you know, going and getting the materials is less critical because if you mess that up, you just go back to the, you know, a locker and go get more things. So that gives you a sense of which tasks are more critical than the others that you get it right. And so that's in, you know, this is a simple example, um, but it, I think it's a good one. Okay. So uh, you think I've done this right? Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, There, there is no the method. There, 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 there uh, yes, I think you, you. It looks good. So you got the roles and responsibility, and you're saying, you know, who's involved. So and, I only have two: janitor and the cleaning coordinator. So you, you, so I, you know, in the in the in the session, I can't remember now the details. If I told about my other coding, which is E for execute, they execute the tasks. So your first column would be E E E E E E. And maybe in column two, they support the execution, or which is an S, or they give input to the execution, which means they tell somebody what to do, and then the other person goes and executes it, or they review and give feedback, and you may or may not listen to their feedback, and then there's the person who gets the A for they get to approve or reject what you've done and make you do it all over again. So when I was in the Navy, as an example, we used, I was called a sweeper. We'd have to sweep the, the living compartments where everybody slept, a hundred bunks in a room on a ship. And we'd sweep the compartments and I got it done so fast that I went and told my, my petty officer in charge that I was done. And he went and looked at it and said, do it again. And so, you know, but it wasn't just feedback. It was, he got the, he was in, you know, because of his rank, He could tell me that he rejected it and do it all over again. So I had to do that. Another sweeper in the compartment might give me feedback that, oh, you missed something in the corner, but I could ignore him. Um, but but so, so, it, so the role clarity here, depending on what your need is, what you're going to do with this data, it, you know, so you sometimes you really want to know there's a lot of people involved, a lot of different job titles or whatever. Who's doing what? Because that's something that you need to teach the new person that's learning this, here's your here's the stuff that needs to be done task-wise to produce that output, and those are the measures. Now, who does what? So we can say, here's what you do, and there's other people involved in some of these tasks and other tasks, perhaps, you're doing this by yourself and there's nobody else involved. So we're trying to uh, capture at this point Role clarity, what are the responsibilities? Is it an E, is it an S, is it an I, is it an R, is it an A? Who's, you know, gets to, what's their role and responsibility in my task performance? So, okay. so there's different ways of looking at that, but that's the goal of that because I believe that when you train somebody, they need to know that somebody else is going to come in and check on them and tell them to do it over again. Oh, okay, well, you know, I... You know, because in the Navy, you couldn't have said, hey, you know, I'm not going to do it. No, <laughs> you, you got to salute and do it. You know, that's their job is to tell you whether or not you're going to do it again or not. And uh, but anyway, so that's that's the goal of, of that is that that's 
teaching somebody this as if it was as simple as one, two, three, A, B, C. But the, okay. the, the, the gap analysis there on the right-hand side, um, the intent of this, of course, is that there are sometimes barriers to performance and master performers generally know what they are, even sometimes they know it consciously, sometimes it's unconscious, but when they go do the work, they do it without thinking about it because it's just, you know, automated. Um, and so what we're trying to tease out there is when we teach the person how to do the cleaning of the classrooms, we need to warn them that these are the issues that they're going to face so that we can teach them after we've captured it, what are the strategies and tactics of the master performers so that they don't have so they can avoid the barriers in the first place. And in the second place, if they're unavoidable, what do they do? How do they recover? So, you know, uh, it's just a, like words of warning here. These are the things you're going to confront. And here's what you can do about them. You know, sometimes you need to, maybe you want to make a, yourself a little job aid, a list of the cleaning materials and put it in your pocket so that you would go get them and not forget it, not to have to make two trips to go get the materials and then go to the room that you're going to clean. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the intent of that is for us to understand, um, the typical performance gaps, what are their causes? And sometimes the cause is because it's a DE as you've got written down here, or it's a D E a K or it's a DI, or it could be a DP. It, this is something that's, uh, newer. I, I wrote a book in between the one session last year and this year's session. And in the book, I, I fixed an issue that I'd had for a long time in my own methodologies and how I documented it, is that there's, there's really three major causes for deficiencies in performance. It's a deficiency of the process itself, because if somebody gave me a, a instruction on how to clean a room and they forgot something, well, then that's the process fault, not the individual performer. So there could be a DP and that the described, defined process, the standard operating procedures, the job aids that we give people, if they're lacking something, then that's a deficiency of the process itself. And so that's one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rumler is that the first thing to look at it in anything is the process. What is it? Is there one? If there is, are people following it? If not, why not? And then the second thing, because he's a humanist and didn't want to, you know, immediately blame the people, he said, so what's in the environment? And is there something deficient in the environment that's causing Guy to be a poor sweeper and not get the job done? Maybe the broom that he has is filthy dirty and you can sweep all day and it's going to leave more dirt behind than it cleans up. Um, or the rags that he's using to dust are filthy dirty and there are no clean rags. And so, therefore, it's not him, it's not the process, it's the environmental supports that enable performance. And so that could be, you know, one of the causes. The other one is a deficiency of the person or people or human. And I divided that into two categories, simply so I could say, I, I'm usually doing this for uh, instructional design purposes. So I want to know what's a knowledge problem and what's another problem. You know, if I was, uh, uh, had a, uh, was, uh, uh, excuse me if I misspeak on this, but if I was in a wheelchair and I can't reach the ceiling to clean the ceiling, you know, I can't get to the top of the whiteboard because I can't get out of my wheelchair, so I can only go so high. So it might be a deficiency of the individual attributes and values. Maybe it's a physical attribute or it's a psychological attribute or it's an intellectual mm -hmm. attribute or it's one of my own values. But in the case I said, where if I'm in a wheelchair, it's a physical attribute that's deficient. Guy can't stand up and get to the top of the whiteboard to clean it. He can only go so far. And so um, that means it's a select. So, so again, I've divided the human issues into a deficiency of knowledge and skills and everything else about a human. And I want to know, what can I train? Well, I can fix a deficiency of knowledge but I can't fix through training a deficiency of a physical thing. If I was a sonar man in the Navy and I had the headset on listening for submarines and I've got lousy hearing, I can't do that job very well. 
And it's not about my training. It's not about my attitude. It's not about my values. It's about my physical limitation. And therefore, it, that suggests all the other human things that aren't knowledge and skill. Well, that's a select recruiting and selection issue. We've recruited mm-hmm. wrong people. We recruited a guy. He doesn't have good hearing. Yet we gave him a job that requires great hearing. And so that's an indictment of the um, selection system or the recruiting and selection system and that we didn't screen well enough for great hearing. And, and therefore, we can't fix this issue with training. We're going to have to fix the issue with changing that system, which is really what that second program that you went through, it addressed those kinds of things a little bit more deeply than the first one did. Okay. So after we identify the deficiencies, then then we uh, we can uh, identify whether we need training or not, right? For example, yeah, whether training is now or the DKs. The DKs we can train away theoretically, yeah. but we can warn the other. We can warn the new learners about these DEs. You're going to have problems finding the cleaning liquids. And if they're not in the cleaning locker, then you got to go here or you got to get the coordinator or you got to do something because you can't go do the job without the cleaning liquids. And if they're not available, so that's that happens all the time, the instructor might warn people. It's going to happen to you all okay. the time. Anticipate it and be prepared to take alternative action. And now we can say, oh, so what is that alternative action? What are my alternatives for resolving this issue It's not mm-hmm. my fault. It's the environment that's at fault. And so that's another reason why to capture this is that now we can, it's, you know, the job is not as easy as one, two, three. There's all these issues. And even in this simple example, we can say there's no cleaning liquids available. Well, okay. So you know, why? Well, the cleaning coordinator fails to buy them. Okay. So what do we do? Do I go to the store and go get them? Do I send the coordinator to go to the store to go get them? Or do we skip the room and skip the cleaning and do something else? And, and we'll come back and do the cleaning later when we have the supplies. What do mm. we do? Because if this is an issue that happens all the time, then we need to give instruction. Part of our instruction is to warn the learner that this is a real world issue. Here's how you resolve it. Here are your alternatives. Your best alternative is A. Your second best is B. Your third is C. But sometimes you're doing C because A and B are not feasible. So that, uh, that helps the learner, you know, do a better job because they understand here's what I would do and here's the issues I'm going to face. And okay. you know, so, so that's, that should be part of the instruction. Now, by instruction, I don't necessarily mean training where they memorize something. It may be that I put this in a job aid, you know, what to do if, you know, there's no liquids or the, the, the you know, there's a, um, The brooms are filthy. What do I do? You know, so, you know, give me some guidance, some job aids, some performance support to help me deal with some of these issues because you can't expect me to memorize everything. And so you put me through some training on how to clean a room, but you might want to give me as part of that training, a little job aid that tells me what to do with the you know typical questions. It's like frequently asked questions. It's a sheet that answers frequently f- discovered problems or whatever, however you might want to label that, but it helps the person um, deal with these issues. And of course, in a training sense, then I'd want to create a, a scenario and exercise where they confront some of these issues and they have to take this alternative action or tell us what they would do if this happens to them. And they'd look at their you know job aid and they go, oh, here, uh, yeah, this is what I would do. Okay, good. Now you you hopefully will remember there's a job aid that tells you what to do should you face these issues. Okay, um, so even all the DEs, uh, we can incorporate them in the training. Yeah, we we can warn maybe them. Maybe it would not be these. in the uh, beginners training. Maybe it would be in the intermediate training because maybe we need to focus people on the simple stuff as the basics, and then we need to teach them how to deal with some more real world problems. So maybe the first thing training I get is how to do things as if it's everything's simple, everything's in place. La di da, and but but maybe the second wave of training, I need to teach them how to deal with these prevalent problems, the typical problems, and that's why we're asking for typical performance gaps, things that happen 
pretty much all the time, not atypical things that happen every 47 years, something happens. Well, you know, that's w- way too much for people, unless, of course, it deals with nuclear explosions. Then we want people to understand, you know, here, you know, eventually we got to tell them, you know, here, be wary of this. Look for the signals that you could have a major problem. It doesn't happen very often. In fact, it happens every 47 years. But if that happens to be your unlucky day, you're going to go up with the, with the, you know, whatever it is. So the other reason I do the, I do this last column, the DEs, the DKs, the DIs, and the DP is if I'm working with a team of people or I'm reviewing this data with my client, I'm getting them to begin to see that training or instruction or learning is only going to directly address some of these things, but not the others. And I need to manipulate them into and open their minds to the fact that training doesn't solve all of your problems. Perhaps it's because the rooms aren't clean and you're asking me for training, but I've uncovered that in fact, the cleaning liquids aren't available and your brooms are filthy. And they go, oh, oh yeah, I guess training won't fix that guy. And I would say, yeah, (laughs) that's right. And so, so I'm helping by, by capturing this data in this format, helping everybody see here's the output, yes or no, that's correct, the client might say, these are the measures, oh yes, these are the tasks, interesting, this is who does what, yeah, 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 these are the typical performance gaps, and usually when I'm reviewing this kind of data with clients that understand the job at a detailed level, maybe they're the supervisor but not the vice president because the vice presidents don't understand this, what janitors do, but janitor supervisors look at this stuff and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, because they see it, it it resonates with them, it rings true. And, but I'm trying to help them understand, here's the ideal performance, here's the gaps and why you have these gaps and training's going to solve solve some of them. We're not going to eliminate these problems, but we will teach people how to deal with these problems. We will teach people to anticipate these problems and what to do should these problems occur. Um, But we won't fix it and make the problem go away. We'll just learn how to better deal with it. And then it's a client decision to fix the root cause of these probable gap causes. Okay. Okay. Now I would like to shift back to the roles, responsibilities columns. Sure. So in this fictional uh, scenario, uh, the uh, cleaning coordinator is number two. Yep. So he's the one that uh, supplies all the cleaning tools and cleaning liquids. So I put uh, S here. Yep. And then he needs to inspect all uh, all the cleaning. All right, so uh, uh, that would be an R. Oh. If if the cleaning coordinator could approve or reject what I'm doing. So so you may want to write this down. This is... E for execute, I they give, um, or S they give support. They are involved in doing it, but they're not the lead. The joke is whoever gets the E for execute, if things go wrong, that's who we execute. <laughs> it's a bad joke, but but so but it, but it helps people remember the E is that, you know, you are on the firing line, you're responsible. If things don't go right, you are in trouble. We're gonna execute you, joking. Um, but so S is support that by helping out, you may be the assistant cleaner and you you don't have the E, you have the S. If you have an I, you're supposed to give inputs, uh, advice or things to the performer who's executing the tasks. If you have an R, that means your job is to give, is to review and give feedback. But I could, I could, accept or reject your feedback if I have the E. So, but if somebody's giving feedback, they may have the A, which is approval and rejection. I might say that, you know, guy, uh, I seen what you've done here. It's no good, do it over again. So I am reviewing it, giving feedback and I'm rejecting it. So A is the ultimate authority, if you will. For, I see. So they have, so they have that. So in a complex performance situation, there may be lots of people giving feedback to the performers. The performers need to know who they really have to listen to. 
Somebody may say, well, I don't really like that. I don't think the table's clean enough. So I need to understand, does that mean I have to do it over again? Or could I ignore their feedback? And so somebody who has the R, their job is to review and give feedback, but they can't force people to, I may, I may want to do it over again because they gave me that feedback, but I don't have to. So it's the different. So there's a lot of noise with feedback. And if somebody says turn right and somebody else turns left, I want to know who's got the R and who's got the A. Because the person who's got the A, if they told me to go right, I'll go right. I don't care that everybody else, 27 people said go left. If the person with the A says go right, I'm turning right and ignoring everybody else. Now, their job was to give me feedback and to tell, you know, get, and, and that. And so their job was to say, go left, because that's what they thought. But the other person who has the A, they are the ultimate authority. So they give, they do the review, they give feedback, and they can approve and reject it. And so that just adds, again, it's all about role clarity. Lots of people could be involved in much more complicated performance. And how do we help the learner understand who who, what's, what's everybody doing here? And I, I'm trying to get this job done. So who are all these other players in the sandbox of performance? And so I need to understand who's the ultimate authority. I could be getting and expecting feedback from lots of different people, but if it's conflicting feedback, if it's conflicting directions, I want to know who has the A, because that's the person I've got to listen to. Mm -hmm. It can be 27 to 1, 27 saying going left, one person says go right, I'm turning right because that's their job in, is the way we've captured it. Okay. So if the cleaning coordinator uh, both can give uh, feedback but also can uh, give approval, so I put R and A? Well, I would just put A because it's it, uh, A is kind of similar uh, to R. I see. So their job so should, is to approve, to approve and reject something. You've got to actually review it. And when you reject it or approve it, that's feedback. Okay. So but, I just need to, you know, so, so part of this is that, you know, this is the way I do it. This is the way I explain it. Please feel free to adapt this rather than adopt it. So use language that works in your context make sense to you and you're comfortable with. Um, you know, there's many other models, uh, if you will, for the E, S, I, R, A. There's a thing called RACI. There's a, there's a several different of these things that help that are there to clarify. Well, I started using these before I ever saw any of those because I started using these back in the early mid 80s. And um, they work for me and they distinguish things so that I can use them as part of training content, instructional content later on, because I want people to know, you have this job, you got the E. Here's who's gonna help you, they got the S. You're gonna get input from the people who have the I, but they can't, you know, you don't really wanna, you don't care what they think or say, they're just supposed to give you input and then you use it, however. If you're not getting the input, go get it because they're supposed to give it to you. And if they're not giving it to you proactively, you reactively go get it. You be proactive. And then other people can give you feedback. And, but here's who you really listen to. You might decide to listen to somebody who's got the R, but if somebody who's got the A says, yeah, I hear you, but no, we're turning right. Then you turn right. And again, it's just to help the learner navigate complex performance, where there's perhaps a lot of people involved and we're trying to get them to focus on what it is they got to do and who to listen to and who to look for from for support, the inputs, et cetera. Does it make sense? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And speaking well, about complex performance, can you do this table with, 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 a, with a complex uh, uh, position, for example, CEO or something? Because... Yes, you think, can. And uh, probably some of the more complex things that I've used this on is for um, uh, pharmaceutical scientists who were, um, uh, they created a thing called combinatorial chemistry, where they could test out various drugs 
and look for reactions. They could do this, you know, instead of doing one little test on one thing, they could do a multitude of tests at one time. And this was for a, a subsidiary of Eli Lilly. This was back in, uh, in the, in the uh, mid to late 90s, if I remember correctly. And uh, um, they had a group at, uh, at Boston that was associated with Harvard, and they had a, a, a two other companies, uh, entities that were working on this. They were all subsidiaries of Eli Lilly. And they had all created their own version of combinatorial chemistry. So I ran a meeting with several people from each of the sites where we all came together and defined one methodology. They had three, but we had to get it down to one. And the Eli Lilly was selling this methodology to a Japanese uh, pharmaceutical company for $40 million. And so the stakes were very, very high. Um, and they had the part of the technology transfer was to train the chemists and pharmaceutical scientists from the Japanese company to at, at, back in the US, back in Indianapolis at the Eli Lilly headquarters. And so the, my clients, which were in the training organization had heard about this issue and the fact that there were three groups and they couldn't, they couldn't agree on how to do this. So I used this, this uh, format to clarify exactly. And what we discovered is that most of the differences were in semantics. And the other one was somebody said you needed to do task two before three and the other group said, no, you need to do three before two. And it didn't really matter. Sometimes these tasks, you know, when you number tasks, it really suggests that they are sequential. Do one and then two and then three and then four and then five. Sometimes you could do one and then you can do two, three, four in any order as long as you do them all before you do five. And so, so what do you do in that case? Well, that, well then, then I asked the group, which one shall we train? We can tell people you can do these in any order that you want. But when we do the training, let's have a consensus here on what way we teach people so that it's not so arbitrary and so many variables. We can, we can teach them do one, then two, then three, then four, then five. And we can tell them afterwards when in the real world, you can do three, two or four in any order that you want. You just have to do them all before you do task five. And you must do task one before two, three and four. So they need to understand that, but it's too confusing to learner to tell them, here's all these options and then try to train them. You want to train them on something that's clean and clear so that when they master that, then you can tell them, you know, two, three, and four can be done in any order. And, and, and so you're just trying to reduce the cognitive load on the learner. And if you confront them with all these possible variations up front, then they'll have a hard time mastering these. Once they've mastered them, then you can tell them, you know, do two, three, and four in any order that you want. You can do it backwards, four, three, and then two. And they should at that point go, yeah, I see that. I get it. Thanks. You know, but, but, but there's a time and a place to do that. And so, but, but this helps you uncover, you know, uh, uh, my thing, my saying is, is that, so this has a process orientation. This is the process for classroom cleaning by janitors. And so, but most processes in, in corporations, in the enterprise, in the university, even most processes are, they are informal. They are unnamed, they are unmeasured, and they are unmanaged. They are just informally done. People get the job done, but they don't, they don't have a name for it. They don't have a standard process for it. They don't, don't have standard measures in place. It all seems to be kind of arbitrary and people have kind of figured that out and they just do it. And you know how you measure something and how I measure it could be different because there's no standard approach, which this is what people who work in Six Sigma and Lean, you know, they try to define what they call the standard work. And that's mm -hmm. what the table does. It defines the standard work. Now, yeah, you could do four, three, two in any order you want. Who cares? Uh, you know, but my, my mother would have said, well, you start dusting at the top and then you dust at the bottom. 
is if you start dusting things on the bottom, if you dust the, the lamp table first and then dust the lamp, the dust from the lamp is gonna fall on the table. So you have to do it all over again. So there's, there, you know, it's not arbitrary. You've got to start at the top and work your way down. So, um, so, but this helps work with groups. When you are a panelist and you don't do this job for a living, you don't know what the right answer is. So you're looking for ways to work with people who do know how to do the work and you're dealing with them when most of their knowledge is non-conscious, 30% of it is usually conscious, seven, up to 70% of it is it's automated. They don't even think about what they're doing. They just do it. You could, they might be able to talk about it, but they're gonna forget certain nuanced things that they think about. And the goal here is to tease all of that out so you can teach a new person how to do this, how to think about it as they're doing it. And so that's what you're trying to elicit. Um, and, and so this is, the, this is the format that I use to help people understand the, the ideal performance on the left and the real world gaps on the right so that we can you know, attend to them, we can train people on them or we can go fix the cause of the gaps. We can figure out, you know, so the probable gap cause there says cleaning coordinator fails to buy the cleaning liquids, but why? And then we get an answer for that. And then we ask, well, why is that why happening? So this is in the quality movement, they talk about asking why five times to try to get to the root cause, which is one of your other questions. So, so that's, that's a little methodology called the five whys. And, um, and some people think it's silly, but the goal here is if you really, and so if you, you, know, if you get a good answer to why is that happening? And somebody will tell you. And now they could say, well, there's three reasons that happens. They're too busy. They ran out of money, funds to buy new supplies. So they're waiting till next week when, the, when they get more budget money and then they'll go buy the supply. You know, there could be several whys as to why something happens. So the goal is to do kind of a breakdown of, you know, asking why. And the, the theory is that if you ask why five times, you're going to get down to the bottom root cause. Now, that makes it sound simple, but if there was three reasons why the cleaning coordinator fails to buy cleaning liquids, we have three sets of whys to ask to get down to the root causes. Um, but but so so that's the, you know root cause analysis is a uh, something that comes out of the uh, mostly out of the quality movement, um, the total quality management movement of the '70s and '80s, and it goes further back. It used to be called variability reduction, but this all goes back to um, even before Western Electric in the 1930s and 40s and the, you know, Japan became a quality superpower in the 60s and 70s um, because they, they use these various statistical means to define processes and outputs and measure them. And so it can be, get quite complex, but to do a, a valid root cause analysis, you would ask why or use some method, you know, and get down to the root cause. And then you do a design of experiments to see, is that really the root cause? So just because you can go through something like asking five five times, you know, if it's high stakes, if it's worth millions of dollars, then you might want to test out that you've really got the root cause and you can control for that variable, that root, and you can eliminate the problem. So you know, root cause analysis is, can be quite detailed and extensive and take some time and some money and some effort to get it done to really mm -hmm. get that in. But from our standpoint, as people who are dealing with instructional design or learning experience design, we don't have to go that far in the root cause usually. You know, it's a see. tell the learner, hey, this is a problem. Here's the some of the reasons for the problem. So be wary, be on the lookout. When you're performing, it's not as easy as A, B, C, one, two, three. It's more complicated than that. And here are some of the complications and here's what you should do about it. Uh, we don't expect learners to necessarily solve all the gap causes. It's, it's Sometimes it's beyond their control. And we don't people to go do a job and then fail when it's not their fault and they, they feel bad for themselves and they get depressed and they quit when it's really, 
what what W. Edwards Deming, the quality guru, the late quality guru, said. It's the system. He attributed. He was a famous statistician. Um, helped Japan. You know, the Japan's biggest quality award is the Deming Award, and Deming said that ninety four percent of all problems are attributed to the system, not to individual performers, but it's the system and management is in control of the system. And so if you've got problems, the fix for the problems is usually not dealing with individual performers and their knowledge and skills or whatever. It's usually part of, in a systems view, you're looking at other variables that are beyond control of the performer. So quit beating, his message was basically, quit beating up the performers for things that are they have no control over. Look at the system and look at it in the a systems view systemically, systematically, and find out what the root causes are and go fix those or learn to live with them. And so one of the things we need to, we need to do, I believe, when we're training people, new people or incumbent people, is that there's some problems that exist in your, in your performance context that we can't get rid of, you can't get rid of, you're just going to have to learn how to deal with them. Anticipate them, see them coming, try to minimize the damage. If they were unavoidable, here's what you do to recover. Because master performers in my model, my theory here, which is part of your other question, is master performers have been there, done that, they figured it out. They're, they're operating at a level higher than other people and we, and we generally know who they are. And we can tap into their uh, uh, it, it, their explicit and implicit knowledge to help people understand how to deal with this. How do I avoid problems? Well, sometimes it's just being on the lookout for them, see them coming, and dealing with them proactively. You know, um, sometimes it's how you react. If this thing happened to you, master performers probably have a war story that they'd say, oh, yeah, that happened to me 10 years ago, and this is what I did to get out of it. And somebody else, yeah, I had a similar instance, but I did something a little bit different. All right, so now we have something we can tell the learners here. If these things happen to you, here's a couple of ways you can deal with it and, and minimize the damage and recover and get back on the performance track, so to speak, quicker and, and minimize the impact of some performance gap cause or barrier or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Another question that I that I have is that uh, um, how how detailed you need to be with with the with these key yes. tasks. So um, if I so uh, so the question was really you know when do we do macro level tasks high level tasks and where we where do we do micro level task analysis and define the tasks at a very very detailed level. So. In my methods um, for instructional design, I do two major things. I do a curriculum architecture design where I'm figuring out an entire learning path. I'm not building any new training. I'm just figuring out what's needed, what do we have, what are the gaps, what are the priorities, where should management put their money. Um, my other methodology is an, is an addy like effort to build content. And But in both of those methods, when I'm doing analysis, I'm okay with high level tasks, macro tasks, because when I go in, then I'm gonna use that macro task data, this kind of data to design the instruction before I develop it. When I go to develop what I've designed that was informed by this analysis data, when I'm doing in development, that's where I'm gonna do micro task analysis. So I could design training on these tasks to produce that output, and then when I go to develop the content after design, I'm going to get the, all the details. I'm going to say, what do you mean get all the cleaning tools and cleaning liquids? It doesn't tell me in that task, where do I get it? How do I get it? You know, So now I need more details about that. But I didn't need that initially in order to design the training. I can just, if I trust my process, I know I'll get that when I do. Mm. I'll develop the content there. That's when I got to create the instructional materials. That's where I've got to get down to the brass tacks, to the nitty gritty, to the, all the details. And so I've deferred that. I avoid analysis paralysis by not going deep 
in the micro tasks way up front. I have learned in the course of projects early on in my career that sometimes the client's going to say, hey, let's just deal, let's start with number two, forget number one. We don't need number one. They're making an arbitrary decision. They could be right or they could be wrong, but they, you know, they have the A, they get to decide. They're the client, they're, it's their money we're investing in instruction. So if they say, skip number one, I might be in a position where I said, you know, I spent eight hours getting all the details on task one, and now you're saying we're not going to use it. You're throwing it out of the design. We're going to develop training without that. I spent eight hours on that. Yeah, that's what I'm avoiding. I, if I know if I've got to prove design and I'm going to develop the instruction, now I know what I really got to attend to, what I got to build, what I'm going to support. And now I can go to town on getting every last detail that a learner needs to be successful. Um, and so a lot of clients complain about, and one of the reasons I believe that you don't see analysis mentioned very much in conferences, in books on instructional design, is because analysis has got a bad reputation for being analysis paralysis. And people spend way too much time getting all sorts of details that they then don't use in the instruction that they develop. And so I've learned to defer in getting certain data when I really need it at the last moment, so to speak, but it's really just timely. It's not way in advance. And so that's the philosophy I use. Now, if my assignment was to do analysis, design and development in a three-day meeting next week, then I'm gonna, when I do the analysis, I'm still going to get a higher level, then I'm gonna design it. And when I do the development, I'm gonna get all the details then. So again, I'm deferring getting every last detail until I'm in my development effort. And I use this analysis data to help me create a logical, reasonable design. You know, what am I going to put in a job aid? What am I going to put in training where, where people have to practice and memorize things? Job aids, we don't want people to necessarily memorize those things. I'm overgeneralizing here. Um, but when I put things in a job aid, I don't expect people to memorize that stuff. I'm going to give them a job aid so they can use it in the workflow. Um, the, I, I'm going to reserve my time in training for giving people information, demonstrations, and then application exercises. And we might practice something five, six, seven, eight times so that they really get it. That's my goal. I'm going to, because I want to spend more of my time in actual whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face classroom training, or if the, if, depending on what's being learned, I could do this on through e-learning, um, but more than, than page turning PowerPoint slides. Um, I need people to practice what really they need to commit to memory and what skills they need to build. And if I can offload some of the content into job aids so that I don't try to force people to memorize that stuff, that's, that's part of my strategy. So I'm using this analysis data to inform my design. And then when I have a design that makes sense, then I'm gonna go build the content. And that's when I gotta get the all the micro tasks. I gotta get mm -hmm. micro knowledge and skills. Just because when we did a knowledge and skill analysis, we said, well, there's this government regulation, you know, 27-14, and that's what you gotta know. Well, I, I can just get it at that. And then later on, when I go to development, I'm gonna to have to say, okay, Tell me about this 2714, and I'll get all the details then in development, but not in design, not in um, analysis. And, and again, part of this is due to the fact that I'm using a team of master performers to do analysis, to do design, and then I may or may not use a team uh, effort in development. It may be one instructional developer working with one SME, but I've got guidance to them so that I can tell them, you know, what to put in part one, part two, part three, part four of the instruction so that I minimize overlaps and gaps when they get to that point. And I, and I have data that tells them, here's some starter data, the performance data, the knowledge and skill data in the design configuration that breaks the training or uh, e-learning into four parts. In part one, you're gonna put in, address this kind of stuff in part two, in part three, in part four, now, go detail it out. So I've, I've really kind of said, you know, um, 
Um, I, I, my intent is to provide that kind of guidance. My intent has always been to avoid getting caught in the details early in the process. Mm -hmm. So in analysis, I need this kind of data. This kind of data allows me to do the knowledge and skill analysis, which was one of your questions. So if I looked at this data and said, I have a knowledge and skill category called laws, regulations, and codes. Can you tell me what laws, regulations, and codes govern this performance? What has the government written down as a law or a regulation or a code that governs this? And we might have said uh, the cleaning supplies, there's, uh, there's regulations uh, regarding how you dispose of cleaning supplies. Okay, and we would capture that. And maybe that's the only one here in my little example. If I said, okay, my next category is company policies and procedures and other guidelines, internal rules, not external rules like government laws and regulations and codes, but internal rules. Do we have any policies and procedures that govern this performance that I need to teach the learner about that? When I'm teaching them how to do this, I got to tell them that, hey, there's a law you got to follow and there's this policy you've got to follow. And maybe the policy is, how often do you replace brooms? You know, I, I'm making this up. Our, our company policy is every month on the first of the month, you get rid of all the old brooms and get new ones. End of story, done. That's the procedure. That's the policy. That's our rules. There's no government regulation that makes us do that. It's just our own internal policy dictates that. Oh, okay. So another knowledge and skill category for me might have been uh, internal organizations. So if I asked, okay, so I, this is the performance. I've got this category called internal organizations and resources. Are there any internal organizations or resources that, that, that are involved in this performance? And I could have said, well, yeah, right there. Number one, get the cleaning and tools and cleaning liquids. You go to the cleaning coordinator. They're over in the cleaning materials locker. I'm making this up. And that, you know, that's an organization that you, you know, you go work with them to get the stuff that you need. Um, and so I could have said, uh, are there any um, uh, computer tools and, and, and hardware and software things that you need when you're doing this part of the job? And we would look at it and go, no, you don't use a computer when you're doing this part of the job. Okay, so, so, so I can use the knowledge and skill categories to have me, so I can systematically derive what are the enabling knowledge and skills. So I've got those 17 categories and I'm using this as my anchor and I'm saying, okay, laws, regulations, code, tell me what they are, if I'm talking to a group. And they'll go, oh yeah, there's that, you know, how you dispose of, uh, of uh, cleaning fluids, duh. And so I write that down. And then I say, okay, in the next category, policies and procedures, and they go, yeah, we got this silly broom policy. We get rid of all the old ones and get new ones on the first of every month. Oh, okay, write that down. And uh, what internal organizations do you work with when you're doing this? Well, you go to the cleaning supplies locker. It's owned by the materials organization, not our organization. So we go to some other organization and we go get the supplies there and and the lit, uh, cleaning coordinator is supposed to do that, but if they're on vacation, then you go do it. Okay, okay, so that's how that works. Um, and what about computer tools? Nope, that's not part of this job at this part. Maybe later on, the people that are doing this, janitors, maybe they do have to time in, check in, time out, you know, with on the computer system. But that's not part of cleaning the classroom, that's some other part of their job, and so, they may have a need for understanding, you know, the a tra time tracking system or something like that. But if it's not in the tasks, not in the outputs, but what we could have discovered when we're doing the knowledge and skill analysis is that I would have said, I'm making this up now. Um, I could have said, so what about computer tools, hardware and software? Do you need to do use any of that when you're doing the job? And somebody should say, oh, yeah. At the when you've cleaned a room, you're supposed to log into the system and say you did it and the time and the date and who did it. And then you go to the next room, and when you're done with that, you have to log in and tell the system there we're missing a task. And everybody goes, Aha, we're missing a task. He told us that it was accurate but incomplete. We found a new task. Let's add that in. And now you add another task at the bottom, log into the system and complete, you know, the paperwork. So 
that's one of the reasons why, you know, so when I'm eliciting knowledge and skills, and that's why I've told the people, we're probably missing something. You know, we've thought about it. You've thought about it. I mean, I don't know anything. I don't do the job. So you guys have thought about it and we think we've got it. Uh, it's accurate. Everybody agrees to that. Guy is saying it's incomplete, even if you guys in the room swear that it's complete and that's it. Because I know through my experience that I may trigger some additional thinking and somebody will say, you know, there is another task. It's, it's logging into the system and saying you completed room, you know, room by room by room and who did it and what time you got done. It's how the system works. And so, um, but that's, that's how we use the enabling knowledge and skills and capture those. I don't know if you have a chart like that that you want to go over, but I'm happy to cover that with you. Um, actually, no, because I'm, I'm still a little bit confused about this. So you've okay. got all these KS item from, uh, from where? I, I made that up in the 80s. The knowledge and skill matrices? Yes. Uh, um, you know, all the KS items in, in this column, yeah. EEO, oh. affirmative action, vacation and day off policy, and so on and so on. All right. So what are those? I can't remember now what's in that course that I got you, uh, that I, I covered. But so when you're doing this performance analysis and you've captured all of these kinds of charts for the whole job, um, then, then you would systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. I thought that was one of your questions. I'm sorry. Maybe, oh, yeah. Here, the knowledge and skill matrices. Yes. Okay. So that's the data capture device and the data reporting device like this device. This format here is a data capturing device and it's a reporting device. I capture it and then I show people this when I'm after I'm done capturing it. So I use the same format to both capture the information and then to report it out. So I have the knowledge and skill matrices. Do you have one of those here? Um, you mean, did, can you see did it you, on my screen? Uh, it's I see the performance in, model. Oh, that's why. Hold on, let me stop sharing and resharing. Okay. Reshare my... Oh, I thought you, you've seen it all this time. No, 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 no. I just knew no. there was a question on here. Yeah, so there it is. Yes. Up so the all top, these items. Yeah, so up there at the knowledge and skill category, it says company policies and procedures. Right? Higher up. Yes. Okay, yeah. That's the category. Another category is loss regulations and codes. Another category is internal organizations and resources. Another category is external organizations. Oh, that, that's the category from that list, the 17 item yep. list? Yep. Oh, So you use okay. those one I at a time. That. You use those one at a time to look at the performance. If you had three performance model charts, you only had one. If you had three, uh -huh. All three of those on this category of company policies and procedures, we would link to the areas of performance A, B, and C, because that's all you would have if you had three charts. Okay. So, you know, your performance could have been uh, set up at the beginning of the day. Uh, area of performance B could have been clean the rooms. <clears throat> C could have been putting everything away at the end of the day. So it's a simple job where you set yourself up with everything you need. You go off and clean a whole bunch of rooms. And then at the end of the day, end of the shift, you clean up and put everything away. A, B, C. And then you would have only had in those linked to areas of performance, A, B, C. But this ah, okay. assumes that there are, I think at the bottom of the page there, I think that it goes, does it go through G? Yeah. So there's, in the example here, there's uh, the uh, seven areas of performance. And as we looked at the performance model charts with this category, we said, what company policies and procedures do we have that relate to A? And somebody might have said EEO, and I would have written it down. And then ah, I, Are there any okay. more for A? And they would have said, oh yeah, we have a policy on, on affirmative action. Okay, write that down. Do we have any other? I see. We, so we would be looking at the outputs and the tasks to stimulate the thinking regarding company policies and procedures. We don't care right now about 
laws, regulations, and codes. We don't care right now about interpersonal skills. We don't care right now about computer tools um, and such. We don't care right now about internal and external organizations. We don't care about materials and supplies right now. We only care about company policies and procedures. So this is a very focused brainstorming. I'm asking people to think about policies and procedures and now look at the performance model chart. Here's the output, here's the tasks. So what policies and procedures relate to these tasks and that output? And then they give them to me and I list them down there. And that's why I've checked AAA and the discipline policy A, and that was it. So then I would shift gears and say, all right, so on, on the second category of knowledge and skills, laws, regulations, and codes, and this is in a deliberate order, because if you are in a highly regulated company environment, then really your policies and procedures probably cover all the laws, regulations, and codes. But if you're in a company, if you're doing this analysis for some other company that's not highly regulated, it's often happens that the company policies and procedures don't cover all the laws, regulations, and codes. So we must use that second category. But if I'm working with a pharmaceutical company I'll tell you, their company policy and procedures cover every last law, regulation, and code. And so we don't need to use that second category for a highly regulated environment. But I always ask the people in the room, are there laws, regulations, and codes that aren't covered by your company policy and procedures? And sometimes they say yes. So it's a it, it begins to show a gap in the company policy and procedures that they're missing addressing something. But that's the intent of this, and that's how you, so when I'm filling out this form on a flip chart easel or on, online on, on a screen, um, I'm only worried about the knowledge and skill item column and the link to areas of performance column. The other five columns I ignore until I've got everything listed under knowledge and skill items, and I've got all the appropriate check marks mm -hmm. they link. So when the, what this tells me is that if I have content on EEO, I only need to address how that is applicable to area performance A. But when I'm dealing with vacation and day off policies, it shows up four times in the way we've configured and chunked the job. So when I talk about, you know, I can't just say, hey, we have a vacation and day off policy. Now, you know, it's really when you're doing A, this is how you do that. Consi uh, consistent with the policy. When you're doing B, it's maybe this a little bit the same, but a little bit different. And so I can say when you're doing B, you've got to you've got to contend with this policy on vacation and days off. When you're doing C, you've got to contend with it. When you're doing D, you've got to contend with it. So it's a different application of that. So the knowledge and skills on vacation and day off policies applies itself to the world of work, A, B, C, and D, it does. And it may be a little bit different or it may be mostly the same. Um, but, but the vacation and day off policy does not apply to E, F, and G. So later on when I go into design, I gotta figure out how do I teach how to deal with the vacation and day off policy. I can see that the performance context for it is in area of work, area of performance A, B, C, and D. And later on, when I'm in my design efforts, I can say, is that the same thing? You just have to know the same, very same thing, and you do the same thing, and whether you're in A, B, C, or D. And somebody might have said, well, when you're doing, at the bottom there, it says staff recruiting, selection, and training. You need to explain when you're doing recruiting, here's our vacation policies. When I'm doing work scheduling, I've got to know that if somebody made a request, the policy is if somebody made the request before you schedule it, you give them the day off. You don't go, hey, I'm sorry, I told you last week that I'm giving you the day off and now I've changed my mind. <laughs> that, you know, the policy may tell a guy, the supervisor, that he can't do that. When I'm doing progressive discipline, I may say, we're, we're going to send you uh, our policy. I'm going to make this up. Our policy is that we're sending you home for two days and that's coming out of your vacation time. There you go. Boom. Oh, that's a different application of the policy. 
here when I'm doing progressive discipline. And the next one is I can't see what that says down there and I can't remember off the top of my head. But, but when I'm doing that part of the job, it may be much the same or a little bit different. Um, and that's not important. But the thing is, this is how you take this data then and do an instructional design. And you want to know, when I talk about vacation and day off policy, I just don't want people to read it and then th pretend they're going to memorize it. I need them to know it's the same or it's different when you're doing A, and then you're doing B, and then you're doing C, and you're doing D. That's where this policy applies in your work. And now I can make sure that I've informed you. I may have tried to get you to memorize that. You know, if we got sued last year and the year before and the year before about one of these things here, then I got to make sure that people understand what they're doing. And I got to tell them in the training, we got sued three years in a row on this and we're stopping that right now. You are not leaving this room until you know how to do deal with that policy correctly because we don't want any more lawsuits. I'm, I'm exaggerating there. But so, so I get all that data and I get this for every knowledge and skill category that seemed to be appropriate. And then I, when I'm done with all of that, now I go back and review the list all over again. And I come back to category one and I say, we've got this column called selection or training. And do we select people who already know EEO? Is it a screen? When we're doing mm. selecting or we give people an internal promotion, do we make sure that we don't put anybody in this job that doesn't know that already? And the answer is, we either select for it, no kidding, every time no one can have the job without it, or eh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Therefore, we got to have training available to deal with the people who don't come into the job with it. So the default is usually training. We usually don't have a selection system that screens for things, especially in the realm of company policies and procedures, because if we hire people from outside, how, do we, how can we expect them to know our policies and procedures on day one, you know, coming in the door? So, so, but sometimes if this was a category of professional knowledge and it said AC, DC, electrical theory, and we know that we're hiring uh, mostly technical skilled people and, and uh, educated uh, degreed engineers, we're going to know that we select for that. We, we select people who already know AC, DC, electrical theory. Yes, you need to know it to do the job, but nobody gets the job without knowing that. It's just one of those basic things. So we either select for these knowledge and skills or we have to train for them. Now, just because we should train for them doesn't mean that we will, but basically we're not selecting for this knowledge and skills and to eventually put training in place, that's a management decision. We're just going to give them information so they can make more intelligent decisions. The next column is, how critical is it to being a master performer? If you were going to be a master performer in whatever job this was, um, and EEO, if you don't know EEO, can you still be a master performer? And we might have said, no, that's highly critical to being a good a master performer in this particular job. That's what the H stands for. Affirmative action, that's highly critical. Mm. Do know that and you screw that up. You're not a master performer by definition. And so the one at the bottom there is that we have policies and procedures about new higher orientation. If How critical is that to being a master performer? Well, somebody could have made the case that, you know, compared to the other things which are highly critical, that's low. Now, somebody might have said, okay, that's really medium and not low, and they could, you know, if I'm working with a group of people, they could be arguing back and forth whether that's a, that's an M or an L. What Guy would have done is he would have written M slash L down and moved on to the next thing rather than argue about that forever. But here in this example, I've just got L. Same thing with this difficulty. How difficult is it to learn this? If you're the typical person coming in to the job, how difficult are these things to learn? Well, this, you know, my example here is that, well, there's only one high and that's the discipline policy. That's difficult to learn. The rest are either medium or low. So, um, and then, so how volatile is this content? How often does it change? If we develop training on this, how often are we going to be updating that training? And everybody said, this is low. And then, so if I had training, how deep does the training need to go? Can I just make people generally aware of it? 
do I need to make them very knowledgeable about this or do I need to make them skilled? And so the, uh, so um, generally, so in, in this category and several other categories, I need to make people knowledgeable about this because how they apply this, I need to make them skillful in A, B, C, and D as they apply it. But if I'm just teaching vacation and day policy, I need to make them knowledgeable about this. And then because I understand my design process, I will make them skillful in how to apply it in A, B, C, and D. But by itself as a topic, I just need to make them knowledgeable. I can't just make them generally aware that, yeah, we got a discipline policy, don't worry about it. Um, but we do have one in case you're asked. No, I need you to know what the policy is. And then I've got, I've got four examples I can tell already by looking at my data. When I teach the, uh, excuse me, vacation and day off policy, I'm going to have to teach it in terms of four contexts, most likely. When you're confronted with this situation, you know, what do you do? And, and so it could be three, four different exercises, if you will, on applying that policy. Now, that's the possibility of it. Um, how important is it compared to everything else that we uncover? You know, may, may, we may not have four examples. Of this. We may say, you know, it's pretty much the same. We just give them one example, one case study, just, and then that's good enough. We're not going to cover all four applications of vacation policies here in, in those four parts of the job. Um, but those are, those are decisions that, have, that get deferred till we are in design. So I'm just asking the, the people in the room usually, how deep would training need to go on this? And either make them generally aware or make them very knowledgeable or they have to practice the skill. So how do you practice the skill of EEO? How do you practice the skill of affirmative action? Well, it's hard to do that unless you're looking at the actual outputs and tasks of so the performance model. That's, this is usually a difficult thing for people learning to do this analysis here is what's the distinction between K and S when you're doing this. If we were in the knowledge skill category of computer software and we had spreadsheets up there as the item, we might have said in the depth of, we may have said skill. We need people to actually be able to set up and de demonstrate a skill on spreadsheets even before we teach them how to use spreadsheets on the job and their job tasks. Um, but anyway, so that's the intent of those other columns is to gather additional data about these mm -hmm. skills so that the instructional designers, the developers have some input going in terms of what's really important here, what's difficult, how deep do I need to go? And, and this informs uh, design decisions much like in many models, you would have said regarding task performance, how frequent, how critical, I forget what the other category is because I don't use these. But basically, I, I, you know, when I'm, if I'm doing instructional analysis and design all by myself and I'm not working with a team, I got to ask people how frequently is this performed, how critical it is. And again, I forget the third dimension. But that's so that it can inform me, the designer, who's working all by myself. But Guy's method is to work with a team to do the design. So uh, what information do I want to have for the design team to work with as they decide what's really important? What are we going to cover at a high level? What are we going to cover at a medium level? What, what are we going to cover at a very deep level and detailed level? Those are the kinds of things that I want to take into my design meeting. And also I'm usually re reviewing this kind of information with my clients to make sure that they concur, to give them some confidence in what we're doing. And then I tell them how I'm gonna use this data later on after analysis, and I'm gonna use it in design uh, efforts. Okay. Yeah, so this, this table uh, put a lot of details into our training, so. Uh, we know how deep we need to go, uh, how important the knowledge is. But actually, um, even if we uh, don't have this table, we can uh, we can create training based on the first uh, skill table, right? This one. Yep. Yes. 
because you can, if you know these knowledge and skill categories, you can go from here to the training by asking them, do we need to mention any laws, regulations, and codes? Are there any company mm-hmm. policies and procedures that we need to capture? So as a designer, if you understand this, these categories, you simply use them to stimulate the thinking so you can get a response. So you're trying to elicit from people who are knowledgeable, if you're working one-on-one with a subject matter expert, I may drag out my chart of 17 categories simply so I don't forget them. It's my little job aid. Um, but I know what questions ask now by looking at that. And, and they can tell me, you know, either there is something or there's nothing there. No, there's no external organizations that you work with, but you do go to the cleaning locker and that's owned by the materials organization. And you and every and all the other uh, units in your enterprise go to the cleaning locker and cleaning supplies, but your organization doesn't own it. The, the materials people do. So that's just, you know, so, you know, we're not one, you know, in a big complicated situation, you may have different parts of manufacturing going to the materials people and asking for materials, you know, and maybe they report up eventually to some vice president and they're all part of one unit, but they're little departments. And so you want to help people understand who do I interact with? Who do I work with to get my job done? And so we can say if there's a there's a cleaning locker over there, part of the materials group, and you go to them when you run out of materials. Do I need to have, you know, do I need to fill out a, an order form or do I just go over there and ask for it and they give it to me? Well, you got to fill out this form in triplicate and then they'll give it to you. Or, you know, sometimes you have to have budget because they're going to charge your department for it. And so you need to have your supervisor sign off and then you go over there with that paperwork and give it to them and then they give you the cleaning supplies. So that kind of stuff, you know, something as simple as that varies from company to company in terms of when you go to the cleaning locker to get cleaning supplies, do they just give it to you? Do you have to have paperwork? You have to have permission? What? You know, so if we don't teach people this, they won't know. They'll eventually figure it out. But but so, you know, so it's a business decision as to what do we need to include in our training? Um, how do we make things easier for the performer, um, you know, there's not much to memorizing the fact that there's a cleaning locker and that some other group owns it and you can just go over there and ask for it and they give it to you. But if there's, no, you got to get your supervisor to sign this piece of paper so you can go check the mat- cleaning materials out. Well, now that's a little trickier. And so now I need to include, make sure that's included in the training so people don't get frustrated that they go over there and somebody says, hey, without the paperwork, you know, go away. You know, so um, again, it's just, you know, how do we get clarity on this and and get all the cleaning tools and cleaning liquids, you know, when we get into the development, we would include the fact that you have to go get a slip of paper signed off by your supervisor. And that's how you go get those materials if that's how that works. So again, I defer the micro tasks to development, but that mm-hmm. Could have been an example of a micro task. Yeah, yeah. All these branching scenarios uh, are a little bit tricky. Yeah. To put on the key task because yeah, there can be a lot of branches. Right, and so you're really trying to make sure that you are have a performance focus. You don't have, you know, this is the issue. You want it to be accurate. You're okay with it being incomplete because you'll fix that later on. You want to make sure it's appropriate because, you know, sometimes things get on into this that are inappropriate that we shouldn't mention. You know, the reason we're doing this is because we got sued. My example earlier Mm -hmm. said, guy, while that's true, it's inappropriate to include that in the training. We don't want to tell people that we're getting sued. So take that out. I go, okay, we'll take that out. Um, sometimes other people might have said, yeah, we want people to know we've gotten sued. That's why we're making a big deal about this. So there's different sensitivities that that organizations have about things. And, you know, we, we want to be appropriate given those sensibility, sensitivities that our organizations have. Um, so I'm really focused here on making sure that what I capture is accurate. I'm okay with it being not quite complete because I will get what I need later on. That's I'm deferring that deliberately. 
Mm. I see. Okay, well, the last question, because I've taken an hour of your time. That's okay, whatever it so, takes. So, <laughs> all, all these key tasks, they're the basis for the worked examples that uh, I mentioned uh, in my question. You know, what you've created here is a worked example. This entire chart is a worked example. Okay. Now, you went back and wrote down, what did you do step one? What did you do step two? What did you do step three, step four, step five? That would go along with this to make it a complete worked example. And you could get tricky with it saying, here's the form. Here's the first thing I do and boom, and build, do a building graphic. You know what that is? Where things pop up and pop up and pop up. And so we can watch in like a little video or a PowerPoint show. You ask, you know, what's the output? And the, the blank chart, all of a sudden it says clean classrooms. And then we ask, then the second step is to ask, well, how do you know a good one from a bad one? And these three things pop up, no dust on chairs, clean floor, no writing on the white, you know, and so you can use that as a work example. That's kind of a living, breathe, breathing work example where you're actually showing the buildup of the data. You're saying, here's the step, there's where the data goes. Here's the step, there's where the data goes. So in my mind, and this is not how everybody looks at this, what you have here is a worked example, a completed worked example, and you can tell me the steps, but it's even more valuable if you were to say step one is to do this, boom, the data pops in. Step two, I ask this, mm -hmm. data goes here. Step three, boom, 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 back and forth. And now people really know how this gets filled out, how this became a complete example. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, if I want to learn more about this, uh, can I read it in your latest book, the one in that came out in 2020? Yes, that that goes into this. Yeah, so that is um, so the premise of that book is that I do instructional analysis in every phase, and this okay. ties into the fact that I get those micro tasks in the development phase. So I'm doing analysis when I'm doing this. I'm doing analysis when I'm doing the knowledge and skill analysis. When I go into design and I start figuring out how to configure this content, how to take this content and plug it into my design. When I'm working with a team of master performers who help me create this analysis data, they invariably say, we're missing something. Step, uh, step uh, task six is entered in the computer system. How did we forget that before? Oh my, oh yeah, okay. So now we're, we're, we're fixing our, our data's completeness issue in design. And later on, when we get into development, we're gonna say, so exactly what, how do you get to the computer system? What do you enter? And so we can get more details then in development. So I've referred to this often as a self-healing process. I just have to get rooted initially in authentic performance, real world stuff, the ideal performance and the typical performance gaps in their causes. And then I've got to work with that to create my design. And then when I go into development and I'm, and I'm going to develop per the design, I have high confidence that I've gotten most things and whatever I'm missing are the details. And that's the job of development to get those. And then when I'm in development and after I create my first drafts of my content, I do alpha testing and beta testing. And then in my model, which you'll see in the book is I do pilot testing as a separate phase after development. And, I've, and I've, I've extracted out of traditional development, which might've done something similar to a pilot test. I've pulled it out and made it a separate phase simply because I wanna make a very big deal about it with my clients. And I say, that's when we're gonna do a full destructive test of the content we're going to try to break it. We're going to, we're going to inspect it. We're going to come together and we're going to deliver it as authentically as possible. And we're going to look for whatever the problems are. Are we still incomplete? Are we somehow inaccurate? Are we somehow inappropriate? We hope that we develop the content based on the design, based on the analysis. And in development, we did the alpha testing and beta testing. But now we've got to put everything together 
and try to break this so we can fix it before we do a general, you know, make it generally available to everybody, um, deploy it or make it accessible or whatever it is that we need to do. Okay. So that's in that, uh, that's in that new book. Um, and, you know, feel free to uh, email me any other questions, or if you'd like to have another meeting, we can do that. I, I appreciate this is a lot to absorb all at once. Yeah. Uh -huh. But, but, but I will send you a, a copy lot. of the video. Yeah. Oh, when we're done here, I will, the video will render and then I will put it on Google drive and send you a link to that. And if you'll just let me know when you've downloaded it so I can free the space back up. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Now, before it. we go, tell me how to pronounce your first and last names. <laughs> I know it's a little bit tricky. Harianto Chahiono. So the J is silent. Harianto okay. Chahiono. But I go by Hari. A lot of people. I, call I, Hari. Well, I saw that, but I thought before we leave, I'm going to capture it on video so that I can practice. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you well, Harry, for uh, attending my session and following up. Thank you very much for your explanation. Again, I uh, really appreciate you you you're taking the time to really respond to my questions. Happy to do Thank so. you very and, uh, much. If you decide to use this in one of your classes and you want uh, to talk to me about it more or have me visit with your class, I'm happy to do that too. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to teach this to my class. That's why I think I'm going to buy your book because okay. I think you need, really need to understand more about it. All right. Well, well, let me know what you think about it. And if you have any questions about all that, again, I'm happy to do this. Um, I'm semi-retired, mostly retired, not so semi. And uh, so uh, I'm happy to, uh, to help. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Guy. Really right, appreciate thank you, it. Harry. All right. Okay. Bye. I'm going to let you go. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.